All right, so we're going to continue with what we were working with last time, and that means either you're going to open your uh, file from last time, or you can get a copy of the file as I left it in the network folder. Remember, in the network folder, into my documents, inside of CS126, tap frenzy code, in there, there's a copy. You want to copy this. Don't open it from the network folder, of course. That's going to affect everyone else. So if you want the code so far, you can get it from the network folder. Copy that to your flash drive. Um, I've got a copy on my own flash drive. I'm going to open the um, FLA file. We're going to start working on uh, two very important things of the project. One is getting points. Uh, there's these little bad guys that are going to be running around. Well, I want to get points from tapping them. And then also I want to start to then put a time limit. Uh, there's going to be some amount of time, whatever amount of time you choose to do this, that the, they will loop over and over. The little characters will loop over and over for some amount of time. So you've got some time to tap them as much as you can. Right now we've only got one character, so it's not going to be that complex, but of course we'll be able to add more. Uh, the important thing is let's uh, go to the window menu and open the scene panel. The scene panel is super useful to, to jump between different scenes, because we've got the title scene, the help scene, and all of that. So open up window menu, scene. I'm going to put this off to the side over here somewhere. Title, S0 title, S0 help, S0, S1 level 1. So um, this little guy is running around, and we want it to be clickable and to get points. So we're going to keep track of points, and we're going to display points on screen. Uh, first, we'll set it up so that when you click the little guy, uh, it'll give you points. So this is going to happen in the scene 1, level 1. Okay, so in the actions layer of um, in frame one of your actions layer, that is, <clears throat> you want to open your actions on frame one of 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 that layer. So right click and then open actions. So on this actions panel, we had a stop command, which we commented out because we don't actually want it to stop there. We want it to play. We want it to loop. So you can ignore that. Next line, we'll say here, note set the current game score to 0. When the game starts, they don't have any points. They've started at zero points. So in order for us to keep track of this, we need to use variables. So say using variables, we can keep track of something that changes. A variable basically is a container. Just like I've got this container right here that at the moment has water, this container can hold apple juice or soda or whatever. So the container is basically a variable. It varies. It changes. So we need to create a container, a variable that will change based on how many points have been accumulated. So we start with var space. That is saying, let's create a variable. Let's create a container that stores the points, var. Then we name it whatever we want. We're going to call it current score, capital S. A container, a variable, can hold any amount of data. This 
container that I'm holding here, let's say it's labeled uh, that it can only hold water. So therefore, I can't put anything else into it, like soda or juice. Well, in ActionScript, we have to say, this is a container, and what kind of data can it hold? So we then say colon, and then we type number, capital N. We're creating a, a container, a variable, called current score, colon number. There's no space in between this. Be careful here. No spaces between the colon. It's all connected. And we're saying this container can only hold numbers. The good thing about this, then, is we cannot accidentally put a different kind of data into this container. Equals space 0. So we've got our object. Current score is what's going to keep track of the current score. It can only hold numbers, and it's currently set to 0. That's what all of this is saying. Our current score variable, also known as an object, um, can only hold number data types and is set to or assigned a value of 0. That equals sign is technically known as the assignment operator. We're assigning, we're taking the thing on the right and putting it into the thing on the left. So the current score is zero. That's how much we start off with. Uh, we'll make a note here. On screen, display the current score. So internally, in the code, in the system, I'm keeping track of my points. But I also want to display it on screen. So we're going to have a little box on screen that shows you the current score. We'll write the code first, and then we'll connect it to the box on screen. Game score underscore txt dot text equals quotes score colon zero I mean space so on screen display the current score on the screen there's going to be a um, box that will hold the score that doesn't exist yet so this would cause an error if we try to run it but we're saying here on screen there's an object there's a box, and we're going to set the text of that box to say score colon quote space plus string capital S parentheses semicolon in the parentheses current score. Okay, well, current score is the variable we just created, which is currently set to zero. When the game starts, we have zero points. So in a box on screen, I want it to say score is zero. That's what all of this is saying. Display the, the string, display the text, score, plus and then display the current score, but then turn it into a string, turn it into words, not numbers. Because this object here, game score, uh, we're changing the text of it. Technically, the box is going to display text, not numbers. So we're converting current score, which is a number, into text. So we'll say the game score text box on screen, or to the, or into the into the game score text box we are setting the text property to say score a string and then the current score converted converted into a string or text So that's what all of that one line of code is basically doing. We're going to have a text box on screen. 
we're going to change the text in the box, which currently is nothing. We're going to change the text in that box to say score, and whatever the current score is, which we start at zero. Okay, well, this is one half of, of one half of the thing, one half of the equation, the code part. The other half is what's visu visible to the person on screen. So after I save this, we're going to create a box, a text box on screen for the person uh, for the person to be able to see what the points are. So I'm going to save that. Save that, and then in our layers, we need to name these layers a little bit differently. Uh, in the layers, I've got uh, actions layer and layer one. Let's change it from layer one to say sprite one. I have one sprite. A sprite is a is an object in a game. Uh, we have currently one object, one little ghost running around. We will have sprite 2, sprite 3, whatever. We'll have different layers for different ghosts or different little characters. We want to create a new layer. I'll put it above sprite 1. We'll call this text boxes. So this layer is going to display some text boxes. I'm going to lock all my layers. So you can click on the little uh, lock icon at the very top to lock them all. Uh, again, it's very easy to lose track of what layer am I working on. So lock the layers that you're not working on and unlock the text box. That's the one we will work on at the moment. So we're going to draw a text box to display the score. We've got text tool and it's set to type of static text. We want to change that to dynamic text. Static text is text that will display on screen and will always stay the same. We need here dynamic text, text that will change. We can set the fonts and all of that later. But I just want to make sure you select the text tool, you select dynamic text, and then we'll draw a little box over here, wherever. <clears throat> Just put uh, an X there for the moment, and then deselect it. You'll style it and align it and change the size of it and colors and all of that a little later. But I just have a generic placeholder box here. It says x. That value will change, of course. As our points increase, the value in there will change. And once you, once you type it and deselect it, you'll see that it's got some uh, dotted lines around it. That just means this is dynamic text. It's going to change uh, based on uh, the code. And when you select it, it has no instance name. So the big thing about any of this code working is when we're interacting with something on the screen, 99% of the time, it needs an instance name. It needs a name so that we can then interact with it in the action script. Well, we're going to call this um, game, oops, game score underscore txt. That's the name that we had. That's the text that we had in the code a moment ago. The code said game score dot text equal to current score. Well, now there's that connection. There's that object on screen that has a name. And then there's the JavaScript that says, into that object, let's put the high score. Let's do a quick test in your device. Because uh, to confirm that this is working, instead of it, when we get to play the game, instead of it saying X there, it should change itself to uh, zero. We've got zero points. It'll say score zero. 
So remember, the first time you do this, you have to go back to your File menu, Air for Android Settings. And you have to set yourself up here with your deployment. You have to put in your P12 file and your password. If you're borrowing my files, you can just use my p my zz.p12 file. The password is zz. Don't tell anyone my password. It's zz. And uh, I'm going to connect it here with my device and then publish it. So let's pause here. Let's make sure that's running onto your device. Uh, if any errors pop up at the bottom, call us over right away. We want to make sure there's no errors. Go from the scene zero title to scene one level one and confirm that the text changes to say um, score zero. All right, did anyone get, uh, did you see that number appear on the screen? Didn't, Shelly? Anyone? Did, did anyone see that appear? Hmm. Let's see, what are we missing here? Embedded fonts? Well, we're using like the most generic font. Let's try something here. Did that one work? Republishing now. Let me try something super basic, sans serif. So sometimes when this doesn't work, uh, it also depends on the font. So let me just confirm here the font. OK, this is what we need to do here. If it didn't display, uh, select your text box and for the moment we're gonna go with a super simple sans serif font in the font family here it was set to times um, go to the very 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 top and we have some super basic fonts that we can use for the moment underscore sans underscore serif underscore typewriter just go, go ahead and select underscore sans that should work the font will look really basic and boring for the moment, but we'll figure out what's going on with fonts in a moment. So give that a try. Change that over to, change your font over to um, underscore sans, and then confirm that it, the text appears. So this is an issue with, okay, we choose a cool font, but if the font is not on the device, the device might not display that font. So I would think Times New Roman, super easy basic font is on every computer, every tablet. I guess it's not on these tablets. But going with a device, uh, going with a um, um, even more basic font like that one, underscore sans, that one should work. So can you guys confirm that? Do you see that now? So just confirming, did everyone see that text change? Waiting. Waiting, okay. 
Okay, so I see it on mine as well here. Now, let's make a little note there just um, to maybe avoid issues in the future. In your uh, action script uh, layer, uh, we'll go back to where we wrote that code. I guess we'll write the note uh, to make sure you see the text set font to underscore sans. Or you'll need to embed the font and that'll be uh, TBD, that'll be pending uh, to be determined. So we'll, we'll do that later. Uh, but just making the note there that if you don't see your font right away, then you want to uh, put underscore sans, and it will, it should then display. What's interesting is it doesn't show the, um, the colon. Hmm, let me check on mine. Uh, it should be there, I see it on mine. Okay, those are the little things we can tweak as yeah. time goes on. All right, so you'll be able to tweak things later on. Like, I think 12 points is way too small. Maybe I put it on, I don't know, 36. That might be more visible. Maybe I'll center it. Where's the centering on this paragraph? Center. So you can tweak that stuff later. But now on screen, it's saying your score is zero. When the game starts, score is zero. That X in that box, it's a dynamic text box, so therefore it changes as we start to tap on the little guy and get points. OK, back to the code. You can center it by selecting the text box. And then on the right side properties inside of paragraph, you have a little center button. Mm -hmm. Okay, next piece of code here. Okay, so these ghosts, um, we can set it up that they've got hit points. Uh, you tap them and you hit them a few times, um, depending how many you want, you know, three hits and it's dead, or 30 hits, or whatever. So they can have hit points. Uh, let's say here, set up hit points for the sprites. VAR, so a variable. Variables, we use them over and over and over because they're containers. They hold a variety of things. Uh, in my case, this is when things will be a little different for different people. I've got a sprite that's a ghost. So my variables are going to be named based on the ghosts. My object here, I, I called it mcghost1. Um, so based on that name, we're creating these variables. So we'll say MC, uh, we'll say MC Ghost One hit points. Whatever you called your particular uh, character from the last time, you can double check what it is by selecting it on the screen and then checking the properties. So MC Ghost One hit points. We have to define that this object holds numbers, can store numbers, so colon number equals. Let's say that this one, once you tap it, once you hit it three times, then it dies. So the total hit points that it has is three. You can, of course, change it to whatever you want here. One hit, and it's dead, or 30, and it's dead. We also then need to keep track of how many hits have we currently hit it. So it starts at a certain point. It's going to decrease down to 0. Another variable, 
MC, of our MC Ghost One current hits colon number zero equals zero. Set up hit points for the sprites. Set up uh, how many hits it currently it starts with. It has not been hit any times. There's a maximum of three hit points it has. We have not started hitting it yet. Space oh, yes. I hear no space on that. Okay, so in order for then, next line, in order for us to use this, we need to set up a way to pay attention to that when we click the ghost, it decreases the hit points. Well, we've already had experience with clicking something to do something. We've had the event listener already. So we start off with MC ghost one dot add event listener parentheses semicolon we'll say here create event listener to wait for a click or tap on the sprite to give me points to give us points So uh, this one right here is, that's the name of the ghost. That's the name of my sprite on the screen. If you called your sprite something else last time, you'll need to use what you called it. And you confirm that by selecting your ghost from last time. And in the properties, I see I called mine MC Ghost. If you called it anything else, MC Face or you know MC sprite one or whatever whatever you called it here is what you're going to re how you're going to refer to it in the code right here like before we set ourselves up that once there's a a tap that happens run a function so touch event capital T capital E dot touch in all capitals underscore tap comma so whenever there is a tap on this ghost comma run a function a function is a collection of actions I want to increment my score I want to increment the hit points I want to play a sound I want to do a bunch of things so that's a function fn that's the prefix that I like to use when we define a function fn hit MC ghost one. This is a function that is related to hitting the first ghost. When I have two ghosts or three ghosts, each one will have its own. Fn hit go MC ghost two or three or whatever. Question? Should, should that have to be yeah, that's yep. what it should be because it's in the middle of the. <laughs> It's either or, lowercase would work fine, but it's, I'm capitalizing it here because it's in the middle of the word. Usually when we're doing this capitalization, it's every word after the first word, just for readability, uh, we capitalize it. Now, it might be confusing for the class, we can vote on it, but you know, we can do MC lowercase, we can do MC uppercase. I would personally do MC uppercase because that's how I'm used to it, but as beginners perhaps, is that confusing that I'm doing one capital and not capital? Any have any thought, anyone have thoughts on that? Any matters? Let's keep it uppercase here just because again, the, the logic of it, just like I had up here, current score, I capitalized S because it's the second word in, in the word here. We had MC ghost hit points because the G and the H and the P are the second words. Well here logically, okay, the first word is FN function, then we've got hit, MC, and then ghost. So next line, function. We need to define what is that. And instead of retyping it, I'll just copy and paste it. 
parentheses, colon, void, space, curly braces, semicolon. So now we're defining, well, what is the function hit MC ghost one? Here's where we're defining it. Here's where we need to remember that we've got event, colon, touch, event, colon, void. break those curly braces apart and then I'm going to write the note here and function hit MC ghost one because I'm going to lose track of that curly brace if um, if we just leave it floating like that So create event listener, wait for the tab to sprite to give us points. Then uh, define the function for when we tap the first sprite. This function should do a variety of things. Function should increase current score. increase the number of hits on a ghost. We have a maximum of three hit points for that ghost. But we tap it once, we have one. We tap it again, we got two. We tap it again, three. When it gets to three, it dies. So it starts at zero taps. It can go to the maximum of three taps. So we're going to increase the number of hits we've done on that sprite. It needs to, if the go, if the sprite is dead, if it reaches the number of maximum hit points, if the sprite is dead, um, remove it from the screen. We need to also play a sound. Every time you hit the ghost, it'll play a sound. We also need to show on screen current score. So internally in this internally in the code, we're keeping track of our points, but we also have to show the points on screen. This is what happens a lot in the disconnect of programming. That in the programming here, yeah, I've got it all set up, it's storing the data, etc. But I'm not showing it to the user. So this function is going to need to do all of those things. And that's the big idea of what a function is. It's a collection of groups of steps, of actions, of things to do. Some of them we can do right now, and, and some of them we'll do a little later. First of all, I want to add one point to my current score. We can set it up, and we'll set it up that we'll have you know random numbers that right now you happen to tap on it when you got two points instead of one. Or you tap on it, and, and it happened to be seven points. We can do a little randomization, but for this first one, we'll just do it very simple. We'll say add one point to the current score. And that's by saying current score plus plus. There's no spaces anywhere there. And that's just a, a quick command that says add one, add one value, add one point to the variable called current score. Current score at when we first run the program is zero. Now here we're saying add one point. We want to do something almost exactly the same for the ghost's current hits. So I'm going to copy the name of that variable um, function uh, MC ghost current hits plus plus. Add one point to the current score and one point to the sprite's current hits. So it would make sense. I tap the ghost, I get a point, I also increase. I'm getting closer to the maximum hit points.
next line display on screen current score well that's going to be exactly the same as what we had above so we can copy the line where we had up here game score text is equal to score whatever just copy that whole line it's the exact same line because the first time we had that one on line 17 or so the first time that uh, we wrote that line we were setting the score to zero well now that the score has been increasing by one we need to display the score again so it's the exact same line as before just copy and paste it as is from approximately line 17 to 37 we're displaying what is the current score tap it once one point Tap it twice, I've got two points. Now here's the part that I need to do a quick little digression here. I forgot something, so let me just look this up really fast. So here's peeking behind the curtain. Uh, console log uh, action script. I forgot how to do this, so I'll just look it up super easily. Uh, external call. Trace. Okay, trace. There we go. Thank you, Ben. So it's just trace, right? Okay, so. Uh, we want, uh, we're not going to do it yet that the ghost dies on screen, but at the very least I want to confirm I've hit the ghost enough times that um, it detects that I've killed the ghost again, I guess. It was dead already if it's a ghost, right? So I want to detect uh, when I've hit the number of hit points. So this is going to be conditional statement, conditional statement checking if I've reached the max hit points on the condition that we've reached the maximum hit points we've killed the sprite or else we haven't reached the maximum hit points yet so let us uh, let we have the ability to still keep hitting it <clears throat> getting points conditional statement so next line here if parentheses curly brace, press enter, it should then close the curly brace, else curly brace, enter, closes the curly brace. So either I've reached the number of hit points or else I haven't reached the number of hit points. This is where we're sort of checking on a condition or asking a question. Have we hit the ghost enough times to reach the maximum hit points? Yes, so do the stuff in this first block. Have we reached the number of hit points? No. Okay, we'll do the part in the second else. So writing the note here. Yes, we've reached the hit points. Or else, no, we haven't reached the hit points. This is what the conditional statement is. And these can be set up to check one or two things, or 12 things, or 90 things. Did this happen? Did this happen? Or did this happen? Or else this or this? We can ask it sort of, did this happen? Did that happen? The first thing we'll ask it here, did we hit the number of hit points? Yes or no? So yes basically is the if block, and no is basically the else block. So what we're checking inside of here, in the if, we've got two variables. One variable is storing our current hits, and one variable is storing our maximum hit points. So we're going to write here if MC ghost one current hits space greater than, the greater than symbol is shift period, MC ghost current hits greater than, the ghost hit points, MC ghost one hit points. So you see, before I hit the ghost, current hits is zero. It's going to then check here. Is zero greater than three? The maximum hit points I've currently got set is three. 
So I'm asking you, is 0 greater than 3? No. So it would jump to the else part and say, no, we haven't reached the points yet. OK, we hit the ghost one time. Current, uh, current hits becomes 1. Is 1 greater than 3? Yes or no? No. So it'll do else again. No, we haven't reached it. Is 2 greater than 3? No, of course. Is 3 greater than 3? No. No. 3 is equal to 3. 3 is not greater than 3. So still, we would, uh, we would get here to the else. Finally, when we, do, uh, when we do current hits one more time, if we hit it one more time, is 4 greater than 3? Yes. Yes, 4 is greater than 3. So then it'll do the code inside of this first portion. And the code that I wanted to do for the moment is a trace. This is going to be a little bit of a message that will appear in the output console. It won't actually display on screen. We don't really need it to display on screen yet. We just want a message for ourselves. Uh, quotes, we say, um, I'm just going to copy the same thing here. Yes, we've reached the hit points. And then on else, trace also. Just copy the same thing without the slashes. Maybe the note here. Display in the output panel the following message. The user will not see a trace message. Only us in animate will we see a message. So traces are, are great for us to give ourselves feedback. But I believe at this point, this is all we need to start checking this. Um, let's save it and, and, and run it on the device, see if we get any errors. We'll fix errors, of course. And to confirm that it's working, you want to tap the ghost. You want to see your high score increase on screen. And then down on the output panel right here in, in Adobe Animate, it'll eventually give you the message of yes, we've reached it, or no, we haven't. Let's save and, and test it. Let's see what you get. So no errors on me so far. Got an error. OK, double click the error so that it takes you to the line number and see if it uh,
It will. We haven't said it that it'll stop keeping track. All right, everyone, let's go on. So what we're going to do here is do a second sprite. We're going to do another sprite, and we're going to see it's going to be very similar. So it's going to be very similar to what we've currently got for another sprite. So this will be practice. I want to make a second ghost, maybe a blue ghost or a different kind of a ghost. So we need to do two things, design the graphic and then write the code. So let's do the graphic first. I'm going to go back to um, my uh, scene right here. I've got a layer called Sprite 1. Therefore, now I will need a new layer called Sprite 2. So I'm going to lock all my current layers, make a new layer, call it Sprite 2, or whatever you'd like to call these things. The order doesn't quite matter, but I'll put it after Sprite 1, and I'll call it Sprite 1, or Sprite 2. We've got a first sprite, we've got a second sprite, a second little graphical thing. So on this new layer, draw a different little bad guy thing, another ghost or robot or goblin or whatever you're, uh, whatever you're, you're doing. So this time I'm going to do, I don't know, a little demon guy. So I'm going to say that this object is my other little sprite that I'm hitting. And remember, uh, whatever is not colored in is actually invisible, meaning that it is not clickable. So if for the off chance my finger happens to hit the eye of that sprite, it will not register as a hit, because I have not filled in any color there. So make sure you fill in colors into your objects for everything to be clickable. So drawing it is one thing. Next, we need to turn it into a symbol, also known as an object. So draw your sprite. Select it. F8 to convert it into a symbol. So again, we don't need to get very complex uh, during the lecture. You'll have your time. Uh, to work on it to make it perfect a little later. So draw your second sprite, F8, to convert it. We'll call this uh, MC Sprite 2, right? We've got MC Sprite 1, MC Sprite 2. So movie clip, turning it into a movie clip, MC Sprite 2, type of movie clip, and 
uh, registration in the center in case it wants to rotate. So now it's a symbol, it's an object. I've got it in the in the library. It's on the stage, and this needs an instance name. Just like when we were tapping on the first ghost, it had MC Ghost One as its instance name. Uh, this this new one, uh, in my case, well, it's going to be MC Demon One. I could have more than one ghost, more than one demon. I could have, I don't know. Uh, balloons floating around, whatever your objects are going to be. So, mine is called here MC Demon 1 and um, it's the object there. I'm gonna put it on a different part of the screen. I wanna animate it similar to what I've done with the first sprite. So outside of the canvas. I'm going to put it somewhere outside. I'm going to convert my sprite to layer. I'm going to right click it, create motion tween. I'll go to frame 96 and move it over somewhere and then in, go, some, go in the areas in between and, and move it around so that it goes to different parts of the screen. This one I'm going to contrast it in that the ghost does do a few loops and such. This one is just going to go perhaps in straight lines, but wiggle around here and there. So you, you, have, these, you have these different sprites doing their own thing. And you just need to uh, you just need to put them on their own layers. Now you can also do this. Notice how making my my demon actually rotate as it goes through the path. That's an easy thing to do here. The way you do that is when you you select anywhere in the motion tween, you've got an op option orient to path. Right now the object is just following along the path very statically. If you activate orient to path, it will rotate into the direction of your path. You can also play with this direction by saying it also rotate clockwise and or counterclockwise as it orients. So that might, might be interesting. I'm gonna put counterclockwise. So here it's going to do one rotation as it goes through the path. I have right here, rotate how many times? I don't know, let's say six times. That's going to rotate all weird and funny like that. Can't get me. So you've got these options for your motion, your motion, motion tween. Okay, so I drew, I drew the sprite, converted it to a symbol, gave it an instance name, animated it. Once those things are done, then it's time to work with the code. The code then allows us that when we click the um, demon, we get points. In this case, what I want to do is I want to do random points. Maybe the demon will give me this time that I tapped it one point, and I try again and it gives me three points, or maybe even negative points. So we'll introduce a little bit of randomness to this. What's that? Question? You want, neg you want negative points? We can do negative points pretty easily. I'll, I'll show that in a moment. 
Yeah, random is all. Random is negative points. <laughs> random is fun too. Okay, so uh, back to our code, our actions layer. What we need to do is we've got to have uh, some setup for this new sprite, just like we did for the first sprite. So just backing up a little bit in general. Uh, we had, we're going to continue to use the same current score, of course, um, the same game score text that we're going to add it in the same place. Well, we're going to need then different variables for the different other sprites, so we'll do that in a moment. We're going to then need an event listener for the other sprite to run its own function. We're going to then need its own function. And then we're going to have a way to either add or subtract or do random points. And it's going to check again, did we, reach the, did we reach the hit points or not, and show that on screen. So everything we've already done, we almost do it similarly, but change a few things. So I, there's a couple of ways to do this in terms of if you uh, group all together the types of things versus grouping together more logically, meaning I could put all my variables together in one area about all the variables. And I can put all my event listener code into an area all about event listeners. And I can put all of my function definitions in an area all about functions. For some people that's very helpful because I go to the spot where all the variables are, they're all there. Uh, I go to the spot where functions are, they're all there. Another way to do it, which is also helpful, is instead I group it together based on a concept. These Two variables relate to this event listener and they relate to this function. So all of this code right here is like one idea. So then I could start on the next part here to start to write the code for my other sprite. So you see the two ways to do this. Group all types of code into one area, but then they're separated by how they link to each other, versus group together all of the types of different code to one particular group of stuff. I think for beginners it makes a little bit more sense to group things together in the idea of concept. So all of the code we've written so far defines our first sprite. I want to then write code that defines our second sprite. And actually I'm going to back up over here to also make a little marker here. This is completely optional, but writing something like this, code for sprite 1. Right, just something visual that I will see right away that all of this code that follows is related to my first sprite. And then code that follows after that is for my other sprite. These comments are not just useful for you to make notes to yourself. They're useful for you also to design your code in terms of this chunk, even from a distance if you can't read it, this chunk from here to here is all the code related to my first sprite. Then next up I'm gonna make a chunk of code related to my second sprite. So next line over here, I'm gonna say code for sprite 2 start and then somewhere over here code for sprite 2 end. Okay, well the code in question is I need to define the hit points of that second sprite. I need to define how many starting hits it has, zero. I need to define uh, the event listener to hit the ghost, and I need to define the function that executes after I hit that, not ghost, that demon. So var, this one is mc demon1 hit points. Colon number. This variable will hold numbers, and we start off with Let's say that let's say this one's a little stronger. It has five hit points. It's more evil, so it has more hit points. So that one's going to be need to tap five times before it's done. 
Well, we also start that one with uh, with zero. We have not started to hit the um, the ghost yet. So MC Demon One current hits zero. We need the event listener to wait for us to tap that to do something. So mine is called MC Demon One. Then dot add event listener. Uh, open and close parentheses. We're waiting for the touch event of touch tap. comma after we tapped that uh, object we'll run a function fn hit mc demon 1 we then define that function and hit MC demon one parentheses colon void curly braces inside of that it's an event of a touch event oops void not the French spelling the American spelling So that's that should look familiar that's exactly as what we did for the first sprite uh, one of the things about action script in many languages is that it's repetitive it's a good thing and a bad thing once sometimes it's a bad thing it's like I feel like I'm typing the same thing over and over but it's good because if you know what you're doing what you've typed the first time subsequent times are going to be very very similar just slight differences like variable names or instance names Okay, so inside of that function, let's first do the really mean one, minus points. If you hit this one, you're going to get minus points. So current score is keeping track of the current score. We added one point by doing plus plus. How do you think we subtract a point? Minus minus. So if anyone hits this demon, they're going to get minus points right away. So whatever they had accumulated, it'll go down. And it'll automatically also go to negative 1, negative 2, negative 20. Minus. So just making the note here. Being very mean, this decrements the current score. Increment, you've probably heard of, right? Did you hear, have you ever heard of the opposite? Decrement. Increment is to increase, decrement is to decrease. So this will decrement, decrement the current points. We then need to start accumulating hit points for this particular sprite. So it's MC Demon current hits plus plus. That one will still increase. We still want to eventually reach the maximum hit points. So that's still going to be a plus plus. But we still need to increase the current, in increase to the hit points, to the max hit points.
This previous function also had the if else statement and display on screen. So pretty much the same thing. If something curly braces enter or else then something else. If the MC demon one current hits is greater than MC demon one hit points, we're going to trace. We're not actually stopping the accumulation of points yet. It'll still go past the points, but we're just uh, giving ourselves a note in the output panel. And I'll just copy and paste that. And we want the high score or the game score to change. So that's exactly the same as before. Game score text equals my current score. Which, if this demon was being hit, is going to decrement those points. Now, as for random, random points and such, we'll do that in a moment. But let's test it at this point. Let's confirm there's no errors up to this point. Uh, go ahead and test it. See if you hit the demon and or your second sprite, and see if it decreases your points instead of increasing. Check mine out. No errors so far. My game loaded up. I'm going to start it. There's the demon spinning and spinning. I'm going to hit it a few times. He's way too fast, but I'm hitting him, and yep, I'm getting minus points. I hit the red ghost, I get positive points. I hit the little demon, I get negative points. All right, anyone need a little help? Did, it, did that one work? OK, here's the code so far. Yeah, let's take a look. Yeah. 
getting that issue. So on mine, stuff is happening. And then uh, I press home, and it goes home. So yeah, it might be, it might be the tablet. All right, anyone else? Is your code working all right? Okay, so right now we've got either add one point or subtract one point. Uh, we're going to create a little random number generator. And this can be used for randomly giving you positive or negative points and also used to randomly assign the hit points. Right now these guys have a set number of hit points. We maybe we want that every time they play they have different number of hit points. So this um, code so far has been the code related to my second sprite. And then this code is related to my first sprite. Let's actually back up before any of this about sprite one, sprite two. Let's back up. We've got a little section about setting like basic things, current score and then game score text. So Let's back up before. This is on mine. It's at about line 19 or so. Your line numbers don't need to line up as mine. But this is before the start of your sprite one. I'm going to make sort of like a little section called random number generators. Code for random number generators. Between these little markers, I'm going to have the code to be able to generate random numbers. We'll have two types of random number generators. One that will only give positive numbers, and one that could give negative or positive numbers. The reason for this is I don't want negative hit points for one of my sprites. I only want positive hit points. But I might want to have negative points, you know, losing a negative amount of points. So the first one here, positive number. random generator. This is a function. Remember, a function is a group of steps grouped together. We'll call this random numgen, random number generator, parentheses, colon number, curly braces. And random num gen. We've had functions before, and we had colon void. You remember what I said? A function could give back a result or not. The functions we've used so far don't give a back don't give back a result. 
this one is going to give a result. It's going to give us back a number. Whenever we use this function, it'll return a number. And so what we put into the function is our limit, which is a number. Give us a number between 1, I mean between 0, and the limit, 7. So give me a number between 1 and 7. This is what we're putting into it. Inside of this function, we'll create a variable called random number, which is to call and type number equals. Math, capital M, dot random, parentheses, semicolon. So there is a command that automatically creates random numbers built into ActionScript. And in most programming languages, there's already something like this built in. The problem is this creates a random number between 0 and 1. How many numbers are there between 0 and 1? More than that. Infinite. <laughs> there are infinite numbers between 0 and 1. Because if you go half of 1 is 1 half. Half of a half is one quarter. Half of a quarter is an sixteenth, eighth, whatever. Half of an eighth is a sixteenth, then a thirty-second, then a sixty-fourth, then a one twenty-eighth, and an infinity. Yeah. So you keep going smaller and smaller and smaller. So there is infinite a number of numbers between zero and one. Did I blow your mind? So this is saying let's let's think of a number, but the problem is it's going to give me something like zero point seven, which is useless. That's not a valid hit point. That's not a valid number of score so we have to say okay before the end of the curly brace I mean before the end of the parenthesis we then have to say um, times limit okay well limit comes from the line right over here when we use the function we will we will put a limit number in here we will say random number gen 7 so it'll take whatever we typed here, it'll put it here. So now it'll think of a random number and multiply it by 7. So now it'll give us a number between 0 and 7, including 0, which I don't want. So to further define, refine this, parentheses, space, plus 1. We'll see why that works in one moment. If they type 0, the maximum number 0, well, ha, you're being funny. We don't want zeros at all. We don't want, we don't want 0 points. We don't want 0 hit points. So if a person puts 0, it becomes 1. Yes, if they put 7, it becomes 8, but I'll get to that in a moment. So here, what it's saying is think of a random number, multiply it by something that's at least 1. You know, 70 times 0 is what? 0. 0. 700 times 0 is? 0. 7,023,000 times 0 is? 0. 0. So any number times 0 will be 0. So that's why we still have to add that 1. We don't want to multiply by 0. It'll always be 0. And then what I want to do is uh, round it. Because technically, we're still going to get you know 1.7, 7.12, 99.99. 9. We want a whole number. We're going to round it. So let's wrap one more parentheses around this whole thing, like this. And we have the math operation to round up or round down, which is math.round. This will round up if it's more than 5. It'll round down if it's less than 4. Now, again, if a person types 0, it'll be plus 1, so it becomes a 1. But if they type 2 and they meant 2, 2 plus 1 is 3. I didn't really mean 3. So actually, we want to make sure we round down. What are we standing on right now in the real world? Floor. A floor. So there is a command, round it down to the floor, whatever number this is. If it's 
1.2, it rounds down to the floor, 1.0. If we had a 7.4, it'll round down to the floor, 7.0. If we had a 9.9, .9, it's going to round down to 9. If we had 1,999,999997, it's going to round down to 1 million. So if the floor is down there, what's up there? Ceiling. The ceiling. ceiling. Most people would say roof. But you've already taken yeah. coding. So. <laughs> Most people say roof. No, there, there's no roof. There's a ceiling, and they spell it seal. Yeah, that'd be funnier. Math sky. Round it up to the sky. Round it up to space. But space is not just up. I can go straight through the Earth's core and get to space. So Anyway, it's seal if I want it to go up. We want it down. We want to make sure our number always rounds down to the floor. Down. And then finally, return random number. OK, so this is saying random. Actually, uh, yeah, forget it. OK, random num gen function takes one parameter. the limit, then use math.random to make a random fraction, multiply by the limit, and round the results down, which is math.floor. And this final thing, then return the value to the main program to use it. So wherever we use the function random num generator and we feed it a number, it'll come back to us some sort of number of hit points. We're going to do something very similar here then for the one that could also include a negative number. Negative or positive number generator. It's another function. This one we will call random num neg gen colon number curly braces the name of this function. So when we invent our own variables or invent our own functions, we can call them however we want, give them the length of, length of the name however we want, etc. You can call them whatever you want. Uh, usually my variables and functions names are kind of long, just so that I can see them right away and then understand what I've uh, <coughs> how I've uh, named them, what they are. The difference here is that we're, we, had, we had a maximum limit. Now we're going to have a starting and ending point. So here we will say low colon number comma high colon number. What's the lowest number? What's the highest number? I want to start with negative 7. And it can go up to 27, so the low number, the high number.
What happens then on the inside here is similar. Variable random number colon number equal to math dot floor. The first time we did it, I showed the random part, then times limit, then plus floor. But now, since we're going to do something very similar, I'll just do it straight ahead here. So first of all, we're going to need to round something down again. Inside these parentheses, we'll have math.random. Now be careful here. I do have two parentheses. One parenthesis closes random, and the other parenthesis closes floor. So that's easy to lose track of. Make sure you've got two right there. If you only got one, well, this is wrong, because if you look at it, this parenthesis is closing random, but there's no close for floor. Make sure you've got two right parentheses, two closing parentheses. Inside, uh, <clears throat> after the first pair of parentheses, but before the second closing one, similar to what we had up here, well, we have a random number. We're going to multiply it by the limit, etc. Well, here's a little bit more, a little bit different because it's. Um, now we have a minimum number and a maximum number. So another pair, another pair of parentheses here. Now we had limit plus one. This one is just going to be one plus high minus low. That, in short, will do the calculation of being able to have a, a, a negative number all the way up to a positive number. But then one more thing. After this, parenthesis plus low. So all of this calculation happens over here, which then gets rounded down. This is still going to give a positive number in the end, what I've got highlighted. The person has chosen to start from a, a negative number up to a positive number. Let's say they put negative 7. We need to take that negative number into account. So that's why there's this final plus low, which could be a negative number. So if it's negative 7, if I have um, decided and done the calculation, we get the random number 1 minus 7, negative 6. So the final calculation subtracts that 7, in my case, going to negative 6. Next line, well, we return that value to be used back in the main program. So these are our random number generators. These create either a positive or negative number. The way we will actually use it is when we're um, when we're let's say let's do the positive one for hit points. Let's say for our second sprite, instead of it um, having the value of five, it'll be a random positive number. So I'll get back to this part in a moment. But this random numgen, the positive one, where we defined our sprite number 2, uh, line 73, it says MC Demon 1 hit points 5. So it'll always be 5. Well, if we use the name of the function we just created, random numgen parentheses 5, now this will create a random positive number up to 5. You know, if we put 25 here, any number between 1 and 25 will be the hit points. So we're doing between uh, 0 and 5. Let's say I don't want 0 or I don't want 1. Well, here's what I do then, plus 2. So it's not going to be the first two numbers. We go above higher than that. But uh, I'll just put here uh, 7. So this will have some amount of hit points up to 7. As for getting points, 
we have it here, current score minus minus. Let's comment that out because I, I want some random amount of a number. Current score plus plus or current score minus minus will just very easily add or subtract one value. We need to do something more complex. We need to run the random number generator and whatever that result is, assign it to the current score. So we're saying current score equals. We're going to set the current score to whatever the random number was. And in this case, it's also going to be um, the, the negative one. So random num gen, random num neg gen from as little as negative 10 points, comma, up to a maximum of three points. So you don't know. Somewhere between negative 10 and 3 are the number of points. It's skewing more toward negative. So every time you click it, every time will be a brand new negative number. You can get three negative numbers in a row. The maximum that it'll be is a 3. So it's really, really, really random here. But now here we've got random numbers to set the hit points, always positive, and here negative numbers that could be negative or that is random numbers that could be negative. I'm going to save it and publish it. And then we'll test this.